morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. I hope you're doing well at home. These longer, lighter days help us all, I think, but the time of careful isolation is getting long. By my calculations, we are now entering our 10th week of staying at home. Steve often closes his opening remarks with, it is good to be together in this place. I look forward to the day that he can say that again to a full meeting house. We don't know when that can safely happen, but it will happen someday and we will all rejoice. In the meantime, this is a test of our endurance and we are trying to stay connected to all of you as best we can. Please let us know if there is something we can do for you that would be helpful. Steve, Laura, and I are all very willing to receive a phone call. Sometimes just having someone to talk to is good medicine. Please check our website for opportunities for fellowship and enrichment in the week to come. At the beginning of each week, we update the schedule. And just now, we are sending out the first printed newsletter we've been able to produce in the last two months. So watch for it in your mail. It is also on the website. And now these words from the prophet Isaiah to call us together in worship. The Lord has called us before we were even born. He has named us from our mother's wombs. He has formed us to be a light for all people, restoring the land. He says to the prisoner, go free. And to those in darkness, come out in the open. The Lord will comfort his people and have pity on their distress. Let us pray. Merciful God, we call you into our presence. Speak to us, comfort us, sustain us, and lead us forth in the week to come. When we grow weary of being alone, come to us in the robust presence of some gift of nature or in the voice of a friend or loved one. When we doubt our strength to carry on, remind us that your promise is to carry each one of us whenever we are weary, just as a shepherd would carry a wounded lamb to safety. Walk with us when we venture outside each day and touch us with the sounds and smells and textures of your magnificent creation. Be present to us in the tender way we seek to be present for one another. Challenge us to be the best we can be, relying on the strength and wisdom and clarity of light that is your gift to each of us. All this we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
we are seeking. For a healing medicine to end this pandemic. For a way to close the divisions in our nation. To be healthy again. The poet Wendell Berry writes, The grace that is the health of creatures can only be held in common. In healing, the scattered members come together. In health, the flesh is graced. The holy enters the world. And in the book of Jeremiah, the prophet writes, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no healing for the wounds of my people? The spiritual that we have often sung in our meeting house answers, There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. In this time, we may not be able to physically come together as a church, yet our communal health depends so much on the bonds that we have created here. We seek for some solace, for that balm of healing to ease the suffering of our world and bring us back together. Let us pray. Loving and healing God, we find ourselves in a time when literally and figuratively we have desperate need for the healing balm of your love. We are in a time of uncertainty, a time when the health of our bodies, our minds, our hearts and spirits suffer in isolation. A time of social and political division. In this time, we see with stark clarity the vast chasm separating poverty and wealth. Help us to spread your healing salve on the wounds we inflict on each other. Help us to reach across that divide and recognize our common cause. Help us to remember those whose suffering is greater than ours, those who have already been fighting the ills and injustices of this world before this pandemic, who may now face even more daunting challenges. In the grace of your love, dear God, Teach us new ways to come together to calm the turbulent and muddy waters of misinformation, obfuscation, and ignorance. Strengthen our own spirits so that we may support those who, in isolation, suffer in the depths of depression and loneliness. Expand our generosity so that we may give to those who have lost loved ones, housing, jobs, those who find themselves unable to provide for their families like they used to. Lead us to that balm in Gilead and help us to spread its healing in all we do. Gracious God, through grace and hope, you bring the scattered members together. We are lifted up by the work done by our church runners, by those who serve at the Homeless Hospitality Center, by our church callers, by the ladies who stitch. We are heartened by birthday car parades and hearts of gratitude displayed in our yards in a grocery bill paid, in a tip that is more than the bill, in the meals prepared, prepared for exhausted hospital workers, we are witness to your generous spirit. In the inevitable blossoms of spring, you heal us as the earth itself is healed. Nature itself is restored. We hear the song of birds again. We breathe cleaner air, drink purer water. We come together singing across an empty square that is free of the debris of daily living. A slowing of our lives has come, and with it, we reflect on who we were and who we will become. In this time when sometimes we feel discouraged and think our works in vain, but then you, the Holy Spirit, revive our souls again. God of life and healing, thank you for showing us that within us is the healing balm of Gilead. That it is we who are the physicians to go out and mend the wounds of your people. May we continue to endeavor to spread that balm in this time and always. In the name of the one who is the balm in Gilead. Amen. Our scripture lesson for this morning begins with a letter to the Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, 
Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. And we continue with Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Here ends our scripture lesson for this morning. morning or good afternoon. I will uh, begin with a quote from an old blues song today, made famous later by the Rolling Stones. The quote is this, you've got to move. You've got to move. When the Lord gets ready, you've got to move. Hang on to that for a little bit. I'm going to come back to it later. Most of the time, the meeting house sits here empty. 
Even under normal conditions, it's used at most for several hours every week. But these days, there's a kind of a spectral quality to its emptiness. We've talked about that before, and you've seen it in the videos that we've made. Except it turns out that the meeting house hasn't exactly been empty. We discovered recently that a guest had taken up residence here in our absence. It was an intrusion that might have had some fairly sizable and lasting consequences, but thankfully a disaster was averted. Okay, so nobody broke in. We didn't find anybody sleeping here. That might have been complicated, but actually that would have been pretty fine. No, what we discovered was that a squirrel had somehow made its way into the facilities and knowing what one does properly when one enters a church, it made its way into the meeting house. The squirrel tore up a few pieces of paper. It ate a cough drop or two, left a little mess behind, and then it must have made its way out. It found its way into the kitchen, too, because it looked like somebody had had a party in there, and it didn't bother to clean up. It chewed through a peanut butter container to get at what was inside. I would do that, too, if I couldn't twist it open. A few days later, Mark found the body of the squirrel, now lifeless, in the hallway back by the kitchen. God only knows what happened, but... Well, the squirrel's not with us anymore. And while I wish we could have just ushered him back outside, I am thankful that there wasn't any real damage that occurred here in the meeting house or elsewhere. But then I thought about it for a little while, and that image of the squirrel and the meeting house, the squirrel and the church, began to take on a greater significance than I had at first imagined. It took on the shape of a metaphor for some of the realities that we're experiencing right now, like democracy, for example, like meeting houses, like structures and institutions everywhere. Democracies require constant care and attention. Otherwise, when your back is turned, unwelcome creatures can find their way into various kinds of houses. And those creatures can do enormous damage before it's all through. Meeting houses, white houses, justice houses, all kinds of houses can be wrecked by squirrels who enter a space, tear it up, and leave everything in disarray when they're gone. That's happened in a number of places around the world and our democracy is no exception. Sometimes squirrels just need to be removed, lest they create further destruction in their wake. But you see, it's a wholly different aspect of the squirrel's visit that I really want to tease out today. Because I think it might also serve as a symbol for what many of us are facing right now. Like the meeting house itself, Our bodies feel a little vacated right now. Our lives feel a little vacated. We've emptied ourselves of much that provided meaning and structure to our days. And while I would argue that some of that emptiness can be productive and salutary, it can often mean that other less desirable things can begin to creep in and take up permanent residence, like a squirrel. Emotionally, it might be a hovering sense of dread or anxiety or fear. It might be the temptation to blame others for the pain that we're all experiencing. It might be anger directed toward those who aren't distancing in quite the same way that we are or who are taking risks that we ourselves wouldn't take. Left unchecked, those emotions can tear through 
our inner lives and leave us more than a little shredded. But these days, what I worry about more is that we ourselves may be in danger of becoming squirrels. We've sat still for far too long, we think. We've reached the outermost limits of our waiting. All those beaches, all those stores, all those restaurants, all that open road just sits there vacant. And many of us are ready to pounce. I can appreciate that. I feel it too. But I'm not sure that we wouldn't be the ones leaving a catastrophic mess behind us by treating all of those now empty spaces as ours simply for the taking. We're all of us getting a little bit squirrely right now, which is pretty understandable. But I think we need to do our best not to become squirrels. And so I have an idea. I'll need to tell you a story to explain the origins of what I'm going to propose. What I'm preparing to suggest won't solve all of our problems. It won't eliminate the struggles that many of us are facing. But it might serve as a way to relieve some of the squirreliness that many of us are feeling right now. It might take us deeper into what it means to live a life of faith it might alleviate some of the tension that we're feeling, reminding us of what it is to be in communion with one another, even though we're apart. In essence, what I wish to propose right now is a kind of sacrament that we might all participate in. It's all of it a way of avoiding the path of the squirrel. But first, let me tell you the story. Many of you know that for the past 19 years over Memorial Day weekend, I have gathered whoever is crazy enough to join me for something that I call the Maryland Challenge. The Appalachian Trail through the state of Maryland runs for a little over 40 miles, and through hikers often challenge themselves to walk all 40 of those miles in a single day. I heard about that practice from a few friends who through hiked the trail. And a couple of years after that, I and two other friends named Brian and David decided that we would give it a shot. Rachel's parents live just about at the halfway point of that trail in Maryland. And so we had a home base from which to begin and end. We started that day when it was still dark outside and we walked all day just talking and visiting the whole time. We stopped for meals, but then we kept on moving. At about mile 30, my friend Brian decided that he had had just about enough. And so he caught a ride and he went back to the house where a beautiful meal awaited him. David and I kept going. And I'm not gonna lie, the last 10 miles, over hilly terrain, over rocks, in the dark, felt like they would never, ever end. But of course they did. And when it was over, we returned to Rachel's parents' house and we enjoyed a middle of the night meal, unlike anything I had ever experienced before. The struggle and the pain had transformed into something else entirely, something celebratory. We did that, we kept on saying. The following year, Brian wanted to prove to himself that he could make it to mile 40, and so we decided to do it again, this time in a driving rain. But we got to the end, and that midnight meal it was just as fabulous, maybe more so. And then the next year, a few more people came, and then it started to take on a life of its own. 
Some years there were just a handful of us. Some years the number swelled to as many as 20 or 25. Some people chose to walk 10 miles or 5 miles. Some people walked 20 or 30. A small core of five or six people always made it to the end, often finishing late, late in the night, one year as late as 3.30 in the morning. There was pain along the way for sure, but there was also celebration and laughter. There was weariness, but there was also a giddy kind of joy, mostly at just being together and doing something a little bit crazy. Over the years for me, the challenge has come to represent the reassurance of long-term friendships. It's come to represent the experience of a sojourn along an arduous path. It's come to represent the pleasure of having bodies in the first place that can move and do things. And it's come to represent the goodness of being in the natural world. It's come to represent the intoxication of a shared release after a difficult undertaking. And it's come to represent the sheer delight of rest when it's all over. Above all, though, for me, hurling along 40 miles of forest trail has come to feel like an apt expression for the life of faith and what it means to endure and to persevere over a long stretch of time in faith. How many times does the New Testament compare faith to a test of endurance, to a race that we're all running? There's the book of Hebrews. Let us run with perseverance the race set before us, it says. There's the book of Acts where the Apostle Paul speaks of not getting distracted and of finishing my race with joy. There's the book of Galatians. You were running a good race, the writer says. Who cut it on you and got you off track? And then there's the book of Philippians. Paul writes in that book about being able to endure all things, whether he is hungry or well-fed, whether he has plenty or whether he has very little. I can do all things through the one who strengthens me, he concludes. Those words are especially important because they seem to have been written by Paul when he was under house arrest in Rome. Because of his faith, Paul had learned the great secret of perseverance, knowing that whatever he was going through, he would be enabled to go on because of God's presence, because of the grace that he had experienced. I can do all things because of the one who strengthens me. The challenge represents all of that to me, and more besides. It is, if you will, a physical manifestation of an invisible reality, which is to say, it has taken on the effect of something like a sacrament for me. Now, COVID-19, of course, has rendered the challenge impossible this year. And I mourned that for a while. But then I had an idea. This is the year to challenge in place. And this is also the year to invite all of you, and I mean that, all of you, to do it with me. You see, I think we need a big shared experience to remind us of the shared ties that exist around here, that exist among us, and to remind us that we're all still in this together, even if we are apart. I think we need ways to 
overcome the loneliness and the isolation that we're all feeling to a greater or a lesser extent. I think we need to move our bodies because nothing mitigates depression better than movement. We need a reminder that we are capable of more than we think we're capable of. Some scientists studying human endurance suggest that when we believe ourselves to be fully tapped out of energy, we've probably only used about 40% of our available resources of our full potential. I think we need a symbol for the experience that we're passing through, a tangible reminder that we can endure this and that we can come out on the other end intact. We need a symbol of what it is to be on a journey of faith in the first place, where we are often asked to go beyond our limits and to make ourselves uncomfortable and to trust that even in that discomfort, we will be given the strength to endure because God is with us. In other words, what I think we need right now is to restore a kind of sacramentality to our lives. And so here's what I have in mind. Next weekend, Memorial Day weekend, I want to invite all of you to pick a challenge that has to do with bodily movement. Ideally, it would be an activity that allows you to cover some kind of distance, whether by walking or running or biking or swimming or paddling. Carlene shares with me that she's going to paddle a longer distance than she's used to. And ideally, whatever you would choose would be something that would take you a little while to get through. But you see, it has to be your challenge, appropriate to your abilities and to your circumstances. For some of us, a 40 or 50 mile day is conceivable. Crazy, but conceivable. For others of us, a couple times around the block, or maybe once around the trails at Essex Meadows, if that's where you happen to be, that's a challenge. That works. For others among us, a few loops around the backyard or maybe around some parking lot would be an appropriate challenge. That works too. But you know, there are other folks among us who no longer even have the ability to walk or to bike, let alone to run. Well then, what about a series of movement challenges involving the arms? I don't know. I can't say the challenge would be particular to you. You just have to pick it and then do it. Even though we're all still distancing as best we can, the idea is to do this together even while we're apart. And so next Saturday or Sunday, either the 23rd or the 24th. Let's all of us undertake those challenges. We're doing it over two days because in households like ours anyway, only one parent can disappear at a time. So I'll support Rachel one day while she does it and she'll support me the other while I do it. And the kids can join us if they want. Couples could do this together. Families could do it with one another. Individuals can do it alone. Player's choice, you decide. But then to make it communal, I'd like to create a church-wide picture and video collage of this whole experience that we can put up online. And so here's the other thing I'm asking. In addition to picking a challenge and doing it, before you start that challenge, take a picture of yourself holding up a sign that names what your challenge is. Just take a picture. And then send us a picture or two while you're doing it. 
You can also send us a short video if you want. Nothing too long, though, please. And then send us a picture of yourself when you're finished, when you're through. We're going to compile it all and turn it into a kind of online art project, a document of FCCOL under quarantine. You can send those things to FCC of old Lime at gmail.com. We'll put that up on the screen. FCC of old Lime at gmail.com. All right, now let me speak to an objection that some of you might be harboring right now. Several objections, actually. Some among you uh, might be out there thinking, oh, I hate that kind of stuff. That would just suck. To which I say back, could anything suck worse than what we're already experiencing? Let's do something different. Let's do something bold. Let's do something creative, something a little crazy, and just see what emerges. Because honestly, what do you have to lose? Could anything suck worse than just staying indoors on your couch? Have you seen the story of the ultra runner who had trained for a 100 mile race that was canceled? That guy ran 100 miles in his apartment on a treadmill. Why not do something a little crazy right now? Besides, everybody's out walking or running right now anyway. Just ramp it up a little bit. Here's another objection. Some of the more pious among us are going to ask, now Steve, what does this have to do with God? And what does this have to do with church? And my response is that it has to do with our bodily and our collective well-being. My response is that it has to do with our flourishing as individuals and as a community, which is, I believe, what God most desires for each of our lives, flourishing. It's a way of bringing us together as a community. And what could be more church than that? Still others might object along different lines of piety, asking, now, what does this have to do with the very real justice issues that are emerging around COVID-19? Why not mobilize a project like that? And to that, I simply say, yes. But let this be a sacramental enactment of the work we're already called to do. The way communion is a kind of sacramental enactment of the sort of lives that we're asked to live. Let this challenge be a sacramental act, demonstrating the long suffering and the struggle that we're all called to, demonstrating the community that we're all called to, demonstrating the endurance and the perseverance that we're all of us asked to undergo in the life of faith. Let this be a symbol of those realities. But let it also be a demonstration of the faith journey that we're all of us undertaking, that we're all of us already on. In just a moment, Lisa Feltis is going to sing a song written by John Rutter just after the fall of the Berlin Wall and just after the release of Nelson Mandela from prison. It's a song called Distant Land, a title that I've borrowed for the title of this sermon. That title speaks, the song speaks, to what it is to journey towards something that seems a long, long way off, something that we can barely imagine. Along such a journey toward a distant land Discouragement often arises. But you know what? Sometimes along such journeys, walls do fall. 
Sometimes along such journeys, prisoners are released. And often viruses and house arrests and quarantines do come to an end. We can do all things because we are strengthened by grace, because we are strengthened by faith, because we are strengthened by God. And so let's undertake a symbolic journey together, one that represents the walk toward that distant land that we're all called to journey toward. But let's also take a lesson from the squirrel. Let's not be the ones charging back into all of those empty spaces just because we can. Let's do our best not to make a mess of things. Let's be a little bit more careful. But let's channel our very real and our very actual pent-up energy toward doing something inspiring toward doing something life-giving and toward doing something that might just be plain fun. Next weekend, let's do this. What do you say? In the words of the Rolling Stones, in the words of those old blues singers, you've got to move. We've Gotta move. Let's go. I see a distant land, it shines so clear. Sometimes it seems so far, sometimes so near. Take the dusty road Help one another Share the heavy load The journey may be long No end in sight There may be hills to climb Or giants to fight With me and you, with me and you, 
I see another time, another place where we can all be one, one human race. The walls will melt away, will come together on the day of freedom. We've come to the end of another Sunday service. I wanna thank all of you for watching out there. I wanna thank you for being a part of this wider community because even though we remain apart, we're still together. We did, as you might be able to see, clean up the mess that the squirrel has made. But even so, we need to remember, we must not become squirrels and we do need to move. Hear these words of benediction in closing. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. And help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you today and forevermore. Amen. Let's get moving.